Upstairs at Fralix, show 411, real one. Mr. Fraley, yes. Uh, have, have you, uh, um, like, when you were a kid, junior high, elementary, and all that, did you have bullies? Of course, I did. I have, I have stories. If you have a story about a particular bully who was close to your heart, if there was something, something you'll always remember, I guess. Mm, just the fact that I was the gay Jewish kid for all four years of high school. It was really brave of you to come out. Yeah, I know. I'm just I, kidding. Really, you I'm know, just bad enough being Jewish. It's worse being gay. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> no, it was well, like, I, I don't think you're either gay or yeah, Jewish. Right? I'm not, that, that would I'm be neither. your wife. I mean, ironically enough, I married a Jew, but I am a gay Jew to boot. Yeah, but I am not gay neither children. gay nor Jewish. I didn't convert. Like everyone thought, my last name in high school was a Jewish last name, and I'm like, it's German. It's not Jewish. Well, I mean, it could. Be. I mean, the thing about Jewish is Jewish is a religion. It's Less less a nationality or ethnicity and more of a religion. You can be German, you can be, a, right, you can well, be Italian. They based it Mexican. off. They based it off my last name and my big schnoz. Well, yeah. Listen, uh, looking at your name, I could tell it's German. And then there was this one kid who turned out to be gay himself, and he was the one who was going throughout high school, going, "Oh, Frey looks gay. Frey looks a fag. He sucks he was cock. Lashing he out. sucks cock." And then it turns out after after high school, he came out. You know, he was one of them self hating gay guys. Self hating gay. So it's just like that was that was literally the worst that ever got. Like other than that, like I wasn't incessantly bullied. Like nobody shoved my head down the toilet, gave me a fucking swirly or nothing like that. I had my ever... own. I had my own group of friends. You know, mm. like I had friends in high school, which was cool. Friends I still talk to to this very day. You know, as a matter I of fact, just I hung had out with maybe one of like... them last night. Guy I've known since I was sixteen. He was fourteen, mm. and we've been friends for. 24 years yeah I, I i still stay in touch with just maybe maybe a couple of people from high school via facebook that's how we found each other and also class reunion websites things like that but um did it i was i wanted to ask did it seem like with the bully thing mm. did it seem like they had this like preternatural ability to just smell your fear and approach you in that way and be aggressive in that way. nothing like that i just felt like it was that way there were two specific bullies i had and and, and the thing about it is i grew up to be really uh, tall and big right? mm -hmm. but back then i was really small and the thing is it's it, it is sort of that dynamic between daniel and and um and johnny johnny's kind of a bigger guy than daniel daniel's kind of small uh frail not terribly muscular in the first movie he's, he's like a young man and I was, that was me for a lot of that time. I didn't really start shooting up there until after high school. You know, when I hit my, um, when I hit uh, 19, maybe when I was 19 or 20, maybe I was a slow grower, but I wound up being taller than my mom eventually. But, uh, <laughs> and my mom's not a tall woman, two of them. Okay. One, one was this Korean kid. There was this Korean kid who was actually shorter than me. And he used to try and bully me and constantly ride me. And he grew up in a black neighborhood in North Philadelphia. So he acted black. But he was Korean, and the thing is, he had no friends. But for some reason, he would had no like gang of friends bullying me or whatever. And he wasn't particularly like into. He didn't have like the fight skills, but he was he was kind of muscular. Maybe he was a little more muscular than me. Maybe a little bulkier than me because I was very skinny. And he used to take swings at me, and, like right in the middle of class. And I'd be like trying to figure out why he's doing this because he didn't seem to have any friends. And the people that I hung out with were scared to death of him. And he was just like this little Korean kid. It was so strange. And then there was this other kid, and his name, I'm, I'm going to drop him right now. His name was Frank Passio. Uh, and I don't care that I'm naming him. Mm. <laughs> uh, he was like a big, muscular Italian guy, and he beat the shit out of me constantly every time he saw me. And he, and what was the problem was, not only did he go to my school, but he lived in my neighborhood. Oh, man. So he'd see me walking down the street and beat me up. And he hung around with big, muscular guys, too. So he was a jock, essentially, basically. I, I used to think of him as a greaseball because he was like, you know, he was like every terrible, uh, exaggerated, st stereotypical thing that you could say about an Italian kid. He was like, you know, he was probably, you know, in the southern from the southern part of the peninsula or maybe Sicilian because his skin was slightly darker. But he was like a big muscular guy and he used to just beat the shit out of me. And I used to come home with bloody noses and blood in my mouth and stuff like that. Jeez. And I eventually, I mean, I, when my mother moved us and everything, he was gone forever. I think, well, no, he came back. <laughs> no. Well, uh, he bullied me in the years before we left for to live in Tennessee for a little while. And he bullied me in the year after. 
at some point, maybe 87 or 88, he disappeared, or maybe I just blocked it out and we moved up to New York. But the, the, the whole bully thing is it's all about sucker punches. It's not about this coordinated thing. One of the reasons Karate Kid actually spoke to me in that way is because of the bully thing. But the thing is, these guys, you know, Johnny and his friends there, mm -hmm. were so coordinated. And they were so good at martial arts. And they were using their martial arts to beat up kids, you know. They were kind of cheating in that way. But when you have a real bully, he just gives you a big, fat sucker punch right across your face. Yeah. I've had my nose broken three times. I've, I've, been, I've been punched more times than I can count. Oh, there was another kid, too. I think his name was Fernando. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was Hispanic when I was living in South Philadelphia. I used to beat the shit out of all the kids my size and my age. My friend Matthew, my other friend John. You know, there. and for some reason, as much as bullies can smell weakness and fear, you can kind of smell a bully, too. That It's it's almost like an animal instinct. You kind of know you're the predator or the prey, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. You don't want to make sure you don't run away. In my, in my case, it was never... People would just use their words against me. Like, nobody ever... I was never physically touched or hurt or anything like that. It was just, like... I had certain kids that would just, you know, say... Talk shit. But, like, you know, my mom... My, like, my mom always taught me. Just ignore stupid people and they go away. Was the neighborhood that you grew up in, like, kind of racist? If it wasn't like... If it wasn't like them? You said you were called a Jew and everything. I, I grew up in South Philadelphia when I was a kid growing up when we came to Philly and it was it was all Italians and Irish and they were incredibly racist toward everybody it was it was mainly the black kids that called me the <clears throat> Jewish because they didn't know any better like oh that no that was New York no, my, when my I came best, to New York that's when I experienced I was, black racism I was in uh, my honors English class and we were talking about I can't even remember what fucking book we were talking about but then this kid Jeremiah I remember him well he turned around, he goes, hey, John, aren't you? I said, Jeremiah, I'm not a damn Jew. Really loudly? <laughs> Very loudly. Because, like, I, I had finally had enough. Like, I was just like, I'm like, I'm like, dude, what? I there, I have nothing against Jewish people. Why the fuck are you insistent that I'm Jewish? Like, are you fucking anti-Semitic or something like that? It's like, do you not like Jews? What the fuck? It's a lot of Jewish people in Chicago. I know that. <laughs> It's so, like, Jesus Christ, dude, I fucking married one, so you know I'm not anti-Semitic, but it's just like, mm. what is everyone else's problem with Jews? Why does everyone think I'm Jewish? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. But that was, the, that, was the, that was the worst that ever got. And then, like I said, the one kid the one kid who would just call me gay and a faggot all the time, you know, that, that was it. Gay. Gay was definitely one of those things we used to, I don't know, me and my friend. Well, I had, th I had three of them, by the way. I had three in the closeters uh, in high school, three of them. Oh, the they second were... high school was over. Oh, they were out. They they came right the fuck out when high school came. And one of them was the bully. Uh, one of them was the self hater, and the other two. He was a self hater in the closet, and the other two were just in the closet. I you know what? I don't even know. I don't even know after high school or whatever how many people came out of the closet. I mean, I can't really imagine. There wasn't anybody. Dude, that let, I me ever even let me tell. Let me tell you something. Suspected back, it back in my high school in the nineties. You could not be gay. Like, if you were gay or a lesbian and you came out, you would face nothing but scorn and ridicule. So only that's why the, people, that's why most people stayed in the closet. The only, the, you know, I mean, maybe I'm just so sheltered or something like that. But the only gay people that I knew that were my age, I didn't meet until maybe the mid to late 90s. I worked with them. And they were, they were kind of, they were, they were, they didn't really have a problem with anyone knowing that they were gay. Well, because then they were, they were like, out yeah, of high school, so they were out of high school. And then even in the late nineties, in the big metropolitan areas, it was socially acceptable. Like we've had boys town in Chicago forever. There's a, there's been a gigantic gay community in Chicago over by Wrigley field for years, you know, gay Cubs fans. Yeah. That's why <laughs> I can't say the joke here. I'm not going to say the joke. We've had a big gay community. But you again, if you're in the suburbs, bumfucked Egypt, not like us, but South Side suburbs, you were gay, you kept it to yourself. You you if you were brave enough to come out, good for you. But if you did DL. all the normie all the normies would freaking just make fun of you incessantly. And it's like I c I couldn't imagine going through that. Nowadays you know? it's it's uh, all the gays are the normies. Pretty much. I mean now <laughs> And we're the freaks. Yeah, it's like we're the freaks. Gay gay whatever, who cares? I don't, I don't want to tread that the But we're going back on Cobra Kai here, we're talking about the bullying. That, that, but that's that is the point. That's why I brought it up. Because this is really there were two components I, I brought up the other day. Is the the one component is that 
there's this bias, this built-in bias that you have about people when you're told about how terrible they were and then making assumptions about how they are now. And then there's a lot of misunderstanding. And then there's this idea. It's the thing that Johnny seizes on when he opens the dojo. He says, you guys are rejects. You guys are nerds. Uh, I'm going to teach you how to defend yourselves. And, you know, maybe you'll have the confidence and all that stuff. But what he doesn't know, that he, what he doesn't realize what he's doing is he's turning these people into assholes for the most part. Even Miguel is not immune to uh, the asshole virus that unfortunately kind of spills over. And as much as we like Johnny, he is an asshole. Uh, and Daniel isn't necessarily an asshole. He's just more of a douchebag. So you have like a battle, the battle of wills between the asshole and the douchebag. Eventually, Johnny does come around, though. I mean, I... Well, he only comes... I think he comes around because... Oh, jeez. Well, I it's can't... a line that Miguel says in season five. He just says, I took karate to defend myself and find balance. You know, and at the end of the day, mm. that's what it should be about. Like, it should be about defending yourself. It should be about finding balance. And at least well, it took yeah. Miguel a little while to, to come to that because I agree with you. At the tail end of season one, he was being a douchebag. He was being full of himself because now he has newfound power and with newfound power becomes corruption. You know, when he was actually act like when he fought, um, what is it? When he fought Robbie at the end of season one. He was do he was Valley. resorting to some dirty bullshit. Like but to a to a bigger extent though, Hawk was the one that got more corrupted by the power. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but, but but that's because I suspect uh, I well, it's obvious to me anyway that Hawk is angrier. He is the one who is constantly bullied. Miguel is a new kid. He's a new kid. He's sort of like the Ralph Macchio analog. He's a new kid in school. And then there's Dimitri, who just wants to play Dungeons and Dragons or whatever else because of Hawk's lip and everything like that. Yeah. And he wants to call attention to his faux hawk that he has. And he winds up becoming, I guess, cool. I don't know. Well, I mean, when you, when, you, when you kick the asses of the bullies, you become... You know, social. Well, you remember at the end of season one, they get they uh, crash that party or something like that, or they find out the seniors are going to throw a party on this part of the beach, and then all of Cobra Kai ends up getting to the beach before anybody else, and then that Yasmin chick who made fun of Aisha, Yasmin gives her that fucking or uh, Aisha gives her that front wedgie. Oh God, the uh, like, <laughs> and no the mercy, hey, and Yasmin, everything. no mercy, wonk. I'm just like, oh. it's like the uh, it's that that is like the scream that that chick lets out is so i felt it in my testicles <laughs> i mean women feel it probably in their ovaries i actually felt that in my testicles because i i never I, uh no one was ever successfully able to and i'm not boasting or bragging here no one was ever successfully able to to perform a wedding neither game. neither was i but on top of that I, you just get the fuck out well, of there get the no, fuck not, out of there when you smell too it personal there guy <laughs> but i started wearing boxer shirts when i was 12 so I didn't. I couldn't wear them. I didn't. Like no, them. I still I like, wear boxer shorts to this day. I will not. I wear. You know what? I I I compromise. I'm a Libra, so I wear boxer. Briefs. I was going to say you wear boxer briefs. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. I need the support. I don't like my shit hanging out there. I really don't. Plus, you know, when I was a kid, boxers were not that well made. When we get to the like the end of the the first season, um, Miguel wins the competition, so it puts Cobra Kai back on the map. And of course, fucking Emperor Palpatine shows up. To be like, yes, good, good, and and he comes. And, well, no, so, I was no. If you want to think about it, Terry Silver is more Emperor Palpatine. I'd say this is more or less Darth Vader. Well, like uh, I said, uh, we, didn't we argue? We we argued at that point a little bit because I think that Kreese is the uh, is the is the mentor and Silver. All right, fine, I'll give I'll give you that because Silver got corrupted because of John Kreese. And all, all right, fine, Emperor Palpatine goes up. So what is you know? I mean, what is Johnny then? I mean. If, you want to call it silver? I mean, like silver. Mm, God, it's hard to tell. I wish there were more bad guys in Star Wars there, that I, I can make there were a lot analogies to. But like I said, this is Star Wars. This is pretty much Star Wars, and the Force, your, your instrument, your your ability is karate. And since fucking Ryan Johnson decided to write the rewrite the motivation of the Force, it might as well be that anyone can get it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like anyone anyone can anyone have the can force. be Force sensitive. Even the kid sweeping on that planet, he just reaches out and mm. his broom comes to yeah, him. Yeah, that. Ah, Fuck you, Ryan Johnson. Yeah, anyway. I mean, I, great. I, you're a great director with Fly and 51 and Ozymandias, but fuck you for that. Anyway. Hey, we got that new Knives Out movie coming out this year, so there we go. 
Aren't they making a TV show? Too? No, no, no. It's, uh, I don't know about the TV show, but the new movie Glass Onions coming out uh, tail end of this year on Netflix. So Glass Onion, that's a um, Beatles song. That's a Beatles song, yep. right? The second season, I just very quickly go Ruth through it because we got still got three, four, and five yeah. to get through. Uh, but the the it seems like doesn't it seem like these these fights just get bigger and more intense? Well, right? that whole high, that's the whole thing. It builds up to that whole high school fucking fight, like the mall fight. The high was, school fight. Oh my god, that high was school on, fight, was, dude. <laughs> I was on the floor watching that. I could not believe that. That was fucked up. I thought they were going to kill Miguel, actually. I thought Miguel was dead. Oh, I knew he wasn't uh, going to die, but, like, I even... Isn't that Tori, the though? The Tori. You? Tori is the one who started I know. That. Tori... I was she the is, one who fucking told evil. you. At the end of season two, you are going to be crushed. Like, and imagine how I felt having to wait a year and a half for the resolution to that, and you only had to go, season three, next. Yeah, you yeah. Can you imagine but what I had know. to go through for that bullshit. You're an early, you're you're an early adopter, so you have to wait. You have to wait with the rest of them. Luckily, I waited, and there it is. And it's I got to see all five seasons in like less than. Yeah, pff, I had to wait a year and a half, man. What did I get? Oh, I think I was doing because this was a half hour show. I was getting four episodes in a day. So I think <laughs> well, it was that's like, why what? I was able to binge season five in one night. Because... Less than two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> I finished this entire show in less than two weeks. Gotta love it. <laughs> uh, I want to bring up Tori. She is my girlfriend. Yes, I am in love with her because she's so gorgeous and everything. But uh, Tori is very much the female version of, of Eli slash Hawk. Yeah. She is very angry because, but also she represents a, a um, she represents, what's the word? Uh, like, like uh, a contradiction to Miguel because they both have the same kind of life. Well, hold on a, a mess- second. Let's, let's. They have a messed up family life. Well, let's, let's you know? backpedal on that real quick. Okay. So, okay, Eli actually comes from a decent home. We have not met Eli's father, but we know he has an overbearing mother, okay? That's that. So Eli? Eli does have an overbearing mother. I don't because remember the, seeing the family. You don't remember the flashback scene where she fucking called the school and said that her son got bullied? His mom was one of them, like a helicopter parent or something like that, called the school to complain about her son getting bullied by people and this and right. that. And the, the principal even says, we don't make fun of facial deformities. And, and so he got outed. But the other they thing They must about, have been in it for like 20 seconds, yeah. and then we never saw them again. The thing about Tori is, you don't find out really about her home life until season three. That you find mm-hmm. out that she's taking care of her mother, who's bedridden with cancer. That, you know, she lives in this she's shitty... She's taking care of yeah, she uh, lives in this a shitty, little brother? Little brother or little but She sister? has a little brother, and then she's taking right, care right. of her mother, who has cancer. Now... And they all live in these ratty old yeah, little apartments. She has Tori is one of your characters to where you can sympathize with her to why she acts the way she acts because she does have a rough home life. Like Miguel, he has a loving mother and a loving grandmother. Yes, his father, we find out in season five, his father is what he is, okay, but at the same time, he's just your average kid. He doesn't have a bad home life. He's just bullied because he's this skinny little kid, which fortunately in season one changes. I mean, right. Tori, we have to sympathize with well, her because she's got still it kind of. He's still kind of skinny, but he, he develops muscle. Yeah, now. he does. So Tori... And he gets... I, I, I don't buy for a second that fucking eagle tattoo or that hawk tattoo on his back. <laughs> I don't buy it. It's a little too... I mean, I was a little too... I was thinking, uh, that's a really good decal. I mean, that's a really good temporary tattoo. I don't believe for a second that he actually sat there and got that done. Neither do I. Tor- I would, it I would be funny if, if it were revealed in the sixth season that you could wash it right off. I would love to see that. Tori, uh, I want. Uh, uh, I did want to say something about Tori because, like I said, she represents the opposite of Miguel because they both have troubling family lives, right? Uh, but she also has the anger that Eli has, which is kind of what you just said. Mm-hmm. But um, the thing is, she does have pretty girl privilege because she is able to just get fired from jobs and get other jobs. Because you you, you 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 hire pretty women, you want people to come into your establishment. I mean, and it seems like she's got a job every five seconds. She's like, um, there's a character in a sitcom, uh, and I forget which sitcom it is. There's a character in a sitcom who is working every fucking job. Oh no, no, I'm thinking of Gilmore Girls and Sean Gunn's character, uh, Kirk. Oh, okay. He he works like a hundred jobs throughout the entire run of the show. He's just any odd job, and she's like that character. She's like James Gunn's brother, basically. <laughs> Yeah, it's one minute on she's working show. at a bistro, the next she's working at a fucking sushi bar and shit like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, and then another one. What, what is this weird ass thing where she's like dressed up as a mermaid for a, a kid's party or something? Oh, um, oh, yeah. Was that, what was that, season four? That was another fight. They were going to fight again because Sam and Tori are just like oil and water. They don't mix. And 
whatever it is. Tori is Sam's bully, right? Yeah. For some reason, she gets really scary for a little while, especially when she's like chasing after her. She grabs the fucking PA mic at, in the. I'm uh, coming high for you, bitch. <laughs> I'm coming for you, bitch. Magnets, bitch. <laughs> Just says magnets, bitch, and then that's it. <clears throat> Sam's running, and, it, and Sam's and it's stupid because it's all over Miguel, who who at the end of it I all, guess, she doesn't yeah. even. She doesn't even fucking end up with Miguel anyway. She ends up with fucking Robbie. They're fighting over a boy. And then there's this little, like, square dance that they do. There's this little do si do where Miguel is with Sam. Then Miguel's with Tori. Robbie's with Sam. And then Robbie's with Tori. They like switching partners all the well, time. Well, I'm glad they stopped that partner, that the partner switching shit after season two. I'm glad they got the whole love. It's train. very, like I said, Melrose Place. Yeah. Oh, I love you. Oh, but I'm, I'm glad. I'm just oh, glad you they got the love triangle. Off. I'm glad they got the love triangle bullshit out of the way early because I'm sorry. I love the Karate Kid. I love this show, and I don't think I could stand for three or four seasons of a bullshit love triangle. Yeah, we didn't really like do that that much in the movie. I mean, like Elizabeth Shue was obviously dating Johnny, but then Elizabeth Shue sees that Johnny's an asshole, starts dating Ralph Macchio, and then I guess we don't really get any kind of complexity with Johnny on that because Johnny's not really he's not complex. That oh yeah, way, I was just gonna say he's not even a complex character of shit. He's again, he's basic. He's like be like Johnny. He likes eighties hair metal. Fast cars and hot chicks. Be like that. And hash browns, and he doesn't know how cell phones and computers work. <laughs> I mean, I don't understand that. That's I, I know I mentioned that yesterday, but I still don't understand it now because, you know, we're of that generation. Well, I'm closer maybe to Johnny's generation, but I totally understand. I get cell phones. I love, I use computers. I use them all the time. I've had, I don't know how many computers in my life I've had. There Jesus, are people out there who purposely count. avoid evolving technology. They, they exist. I mean, shit. I've got people who come into my store and they have no business working on smartphones because they don't know what the fuck they're doing. Like I've always, I always tell people, I don't blame the device. I blame the users, you know? And if you're trying to, if you don't know how to use it, don't fucking use it. I'm thinking of this scene in the, in the Tom Green movie, Freddie got fingered where he puts a, he puts his wireless phone he puts a wireless, just a regular cordless phone into his briefcase when he goes on this date with this girl. And he has a tape recorder and he hits the play button and it's just a telephone ringing. And he says, oh, excuse me, I have to take this. I'm on my cellular telephone. Oh, God. <laughs> it was like the funniest thing. I mean, he was pretending he was on a cell phone, but it's actually just a cordless phone. <laughs> to you, maybe that's funny. Not to me. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was funny because he was trying to impress this girl. <laughs> the chick in the wheelchair, right? Yeah, the chick in the wheelchair likes to get hit with, with bamboo reeds and give blowjobs. She's like, I don't care about jewels or money. I just want to suck your cock. Yeah, oh, God, that movie. Oh, that fucking movie. He's like, do you mean it, Betty? We go we go from fucking Cobra Kai to Freddy Got Fingered. This is the kind I'm of, sorry, I'm sorry. I have to, I, I just say, have to point that out. This is the kind of show we have, people. Fucking I, I just have to say, I know, I'm not a Tom Green fan either, but Freddy Got Fingered is seriously one of the funniest movies that always had me on the floor. The only time I don't like it is when, you know, he's whacking off an elephant or trying to grab a horse's penis. No. You know, but generally, I, I, I like... I like a lot of that weird shit that he does. <laughs> <laughs> like the oh, and attacking people in restaurants and the kid always getting hit with things he gets hit with. A baseball has got horrible blood all over him. <clears throat> anyway. Oh, he's, but you know, that's a movie about being bullied too. I mean, he gets bullied by his dad who's played by Rip Torn. Yeah. And he lashes out and he be, pretend he lies to, he lies to a therapist and says that his, his dad molests him. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's why it's called Freddy Got Freddy. Uh -huh. But his little brother, he, he touches my little brother in his pants. He fingers him. <laughs> and my, my wife hates Tom Green but loves that movie. Okay. That's all I'm anyway, going to Okay. I insist that you go back and revisit, but you can't find it on Blu-ray, unfortunately. It's only on DVD for some strange reason. Mm, gee, anyway. Well, because you know why? Disney <laughs> owns it now, and Disney ain't fucking putting it on Blu-ray, man. All right, so let's get back to... Um, Season two, ending with the absolute shocker, which is, again, you got Robbie and Miguel and you got Tori and Sam and they're fighting and it causes all this other fighting to spill out and into the high school. And like Miguel just completely flops over this rail and he goes falling in the slow motion shot. And I'm just like, and you see oh what's sad about that? God, Miguel actually wanted to stop the fight. Like he realized, like he was like, I'm sorry, you know, this is. He, and in one moment, and then Robbie just went fucking full Sith and struck a dirty blow and knocked him right on the rail. Now, why is that? Is that because he thought Miguel was stealing Tori or, or 
what was it? It, it was, was it was, be, what was the genesis was always, of the anger? There was always tension. But, oh, no, don't come on, man. There was tension between Robbie and Miguel because Miguel was spending Miguel all the was, time with Johnny, fucking Robbie. Miguel father. was being trained by Johnny, but the thing is, Robbie acts like he hates his dad. Robbie was under Danielson's wing for a little bit, and then they play these weird games where they would keep going back and forth. Where, well, see, you know, the, John, Johnny, Johnny, and, and Daniel are hanging out for a little bit, and then they get into a fight, and then they hang out again, and then they get into a fight, and they keep doing this for like three seasons, I think. Well, yeah. So it ends up happening at the end of it. So the last episode. Johnny and Daniel, what they seem to squash their shit, unfortunately, but then comes the night this of the... This is Crease, though. This is Crease's influence on Robbie. Is that what it is? Well, no, no not yet. Influence not yet. On Miguel. not there yet. Okay. Um, so what happens is... So they have that party. Uh, what is it? Sam kisses Miguel. Robbie's up back off in the distance. Tori sees it. And then Robbie gets Sam, and they go to Johnny's house that night because Sam is too drunk. She can't go home. Like, she even says, don't take me home. I'm too drunk. And then Robbie gets the idea to go to his dad's house. And then, unfortunately, Sam doesn't come home. Daniel's able to track her on her phone, finds that she's at Johnny's house. And then he flips it. Daniel flips his fucking shit. You oh, know, yeah, without, really drunk, you know, right. he just jumping to a fucking conclusion that he didn't need to jump to. He just became a. See, that's the thing about Daniel. And that's what I love about this show is that hmm. even in all the other Karate Kid movies, he's a fucking hothead. It's like Daniel is a hothead. He's always been a fucking hothead. Yeah, but you notice, I mean, they kind of change his characterization a little well, bit. Well, a little bit, first... but he's, I mean, I get it, but he's in the still first kind handful of, a of episodes. Jumped, he's in the, always in the, a hothead um... who jumps to conclusions, at least in the first couple of seasons. He's a... Well, no, I mean, I was going to say the first couple of episodes of season one, which he's barely in, by the way, I might add, he's trying to do this cool thing. He's trying to stay cool, and he's like, hey, we're all grown-ups here. Come on. We don't fight anymore. Johnny's still upset because Johnny, that's just the way he is. He, he, his whole life was ruined, I guess, by that All Valley thing. It was, but, then, like, we're trying to move beyond that in the Well, that's show, how he sees then, like, it. That's the whole, how he sees it. The whole it. fight happens, but, again, Robbie and Robbie and Miguel's bullshit, it was never over. It became about the girl. It became about Sam in season three, more or less, but in the first two seasons, it was always that Robbie was jealous that Miguel, you know, was spending all his time with his father, even though, oh, I hate my dad, but I'm pissed off because this other guy is spending time with my dad. So that's how you know Robbie was a messed up kid. You know, how about how about we 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 can we can we throw a little bit of that blame on the mom? Oh, yeah. Like, dude, because yeah, she isn't bit, there. Yeah, she's just, just a complete. A messed up if you kid. think Johnny's a loser, that's what's so shocking. about yeah. it. If you think Johnny's a loser. God, look at his mom. His mom is a total fucking loser because she doesn't even she can't even install a flat screen TV. You know? <laughs> yeah. And then he, you know, Robbie tries to go like Robbie gets out, at, you know, at the end of season two, unfortunately, beginning of season three. You know, you find out Robbie's on the run, you know, because of what happened in the school. And then that's he takes off. Yeah. Is that what it is? He flees there. God, I saw this. You know, this is a problem. OK, you, you, you have a benefit of watching of, of binge watching this stuff now. But unfortunately, like if if we had waited like you did and other people, if we had waited between scenes, it's, it's easier to uh, to tell when things are happening because it all comes as a big like a big blur when you're watching when you're binge watching it. So it's really hard to tell when things are happening in each season. But I guess yeah, okay, so if we begin season 3, where has Robbie gone? Robbie is just on the lamb. He is he Oh, is this okay, this, so this is the whole Dodge Caravan. Yeah, the Dodge um, Caravan situation. Yes. So because he gets, yeah, he takes Oh, and then we get Kickstart My Heart, which is one of my favorite bits. Oh Actually, yeah, we're, John, we're Johnny and yeah. Daniel go on the road looking for Robbie. Yeah. And for, for a time. And then there's a car chase scene involving Kickstart My Heart, which is really awesome. I love that. It's like one of my favorite records. I got to really point that out. Um, I wanted to point that out right there. Uh, Dr. Feelgood was one of the first CDs I ever bought. Hmm. So it's in that grouping of CDs. I told you about some of them. Ride, Ride the Lightning, Iron Maiden, Power Power Slave, and Dr. Feelgood and the Gene Simmons Kiss solo album. Grabbed them all on, on CD when I first bought my first CD player. You see, I was lucky enough to grow up down the street from my cousin, who is, I believe, seven years older than I am. But mm -hmm. we hung out all the time, and he introduced me to, like, everything. Like, he introduced me to Motley Crue, Queensryche, Metallica, Aerosmith, mm -hmm. specifically the big Operation one. Mind Crime, that's another one yeah, of my first Yeah, Mind CDs. Crime is, I love Mind Crime. Uh, specifically, though, Van Halen, that, that was and always will be his favorite band is Van Halen. 
And that was the band he really introduced me to. But he introduced me to a lot of shit. Like, I remember when he got Dr. Feelgood, and I heard it for the first time, you know, and I love Dr. Feelgood. Even, Dr. Even Feelgood though it is not and my favorite Shout Motley. at the Devil are my favorite uh, Motley Crue uh, Too records. Fast for Love is still my favorite Motley Crue. Record. I don't know about Too Fast. Too Fast for Love is, you know, Shout at the Devil. It's got and, that early and... punk influence on it, and it's a very rough record, and there's a lot of good songs on there. I just think it yeah. captures Motley Crue when they were kids, when they were really talented. I mean, they were still talented. But it's like when they were doing their own thing before the producers started dictating their sound, you know, like Motley Crue was doing their own thing on them first two records. That's what I like. Yeah, that's Dr. Feelgood like definitely has Bob records. Rock's imprint, imprint all over Yeah, it. fuck Bob Rock, fucking asshole. But he's the guy who takes bands and turns them into multi-platinum. So, I mean, he did that with uh, the Bon Jovi. He did that with Bon Jovi. Uh, what is Metallica. It? Metallica. Ugh. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I didn't really. I like I said, I love Dr. Feelgood. I, you know, uh, Metallica for me. When they started doing, when they did the Black Album, they were all over the place and all that Enter Sandman stuff. I mean, I like, I enjoyed it, but then it kind of overkilled. I mean, like Injustice for All is still a favorite. Master of Puppets, Ride the Lightning, Kill 'Em All. Just the first, the first four Metallica records are great. Hell, and the Garage, the Garage Days. Garage Days is actually very underrated. I really like that album. Garage Days is fat, awesome. Yeah, I love Garage. I have, I have the 998 CD. That was another. Of my early CD purchases. See, I did, I wasn't lucky enough to get that. Now I did. I do have. I do have at my parents' house, safely locked away. Uh, I have the 590 ADP on vinyl. Mm, yeah, I do have it on yeah, vinyl. I would love to have that. Um, just to have it for just to have it on vinyl. Yeah. But I I did have it. I do have it on. Um, but it doesn't really matter because then they released Garage Incorporated, which put all that shit together anyway. Yeah. I'm glad we're talking about music now because there is a definite heavy metal component vibe to this whole thing. Johnny's always wearing Metallica shirts and, and stuff like that. And not even iron, un, unironically, the way Gen Z wear... I, you, you see these Gen Z kids wearing Nirvana shirts? Yeah, like, I don't want to talk. Do you know about anything about Nirvana? It was like, uh, it was a cool shirt, man. Well, the cool thing I is, mean, dude, Some of them know. The, some of them know, but... The really cool don't. thing is, dude, I have a Gen Z co-worker, though, who is super into the fucking 90s, though. He knows the bands, he, wears oh, the he shirts, knows the but bands, knows the bands. Dude, he plays deep cuts, like... He is a gigantic alt fan. Like, he will play Soundgarden, fucking Nirvana, Pearl Jam. Like, he's really into, like, he's really into new, like, the stuff that I grew up with, you know what I'm saying? Stuff that we, I say, we as me and you mutually grew up with, he's down with that. He's just the not best big, music. He's not big into 80s shit, though. He's just a big gen, he's a Gen Zer. Who likes Gen X shit? You know what I oh, mean. Oh, but we got we got the best of both worlds, dude. Yeah, I know. We got, we did. Like, we got the best. We're, we're old of enough us. to understand and appreciate Led Zeppelin. We're old enough to understand and appreciate like fucking Deep Purple, and then getting into grunge, and also having that bullshit '80s pop phase, and also Poison. You know, shit like that. And what's the first song we hear? In this entire show is uh, nothing, nothing but a, but good, a time good time by Poison. First song we ever hear, which is like, oh my god, I, I was like. It's like kind of like a time machine a little bit. Oh, you want to talk? I about, understand. You talk what made me happy in the pants is when instead of taking the easy route and playing uh, round and round from Rat, they did fucking lay it down. Yeah, and lay it down that's, is like and, my, one of my favorite Rat songs. That's where you get the idea that like Hurwitz and Schlossberg, they're not just fucking with you and just doing a greatest K Tell sessions presents greatest hits of the '80s kind of thing. <laughs> There's Unchained. They played Unchained. Yeah. From Van Halen, I was like, "What, really, well, dude? How You're about going with okay, that? dude? How about this? How about that fucking Banana Rama cover at the end of season two? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Oh god, that was so. I remember. Um, okay, because they played they played the original at the beginning of the episode. My wife walks in and she goes, "That's Banana Rama. Yep, that's Cruel Summer." And then they do this. Of course, they do this kind of like wispy, almost half whispering acoustic cover of Cruel Summer. Which is you know? fucking dope, dude. I love how they did that. That's why I say, you know, these acoustic covers are awesome. I found I love how like, they brought last in night the, when I was I talking to you. I love how they brought in music from the old soundtracks like that, um, what is it, when they are at Golf and Stuff in first season and that same exact song is playing in the background like when Daniel and Allie first went to the first time. Yeah, yeah. It's so fucking awesome how they did that. Oh, you know, it was even, okay, it was, <laughs> I, they were kind of obviously doing a, a little bit of a parody here, but Johnny was having, I don't know, it actually wasn't Johnny's dream, it was it was his, his girlfriend's dream. Oh, yeah, when they were doing Playing with the Boys, Top Gun. Kenny Loggins. <laughs> they were doing Playing with the Boys with the, except that no, there was no topless homoerotic volleyball, but they were also doing the tongue sucking scene yep. with him and Kelly McGillis in the blue light and everything. She was having that dream, which is really cool. I thought that was cool. Oh, I love the first dream sequence. Oh, what was the song they fucking used on that first dream sequence he had? Here I go again from White Snake. 
Here I go again. <laughs> that was yeah, awesome. he was having a dream about her being Tawny Katane. Yes. So she's Tawny Katane. He's Tom Cruise. Okay, so we get. I want to talk about the music a little bit because uh, the Karate Kid movies were not that kind of thing. They weren't heavy metal. They were power ballads, right? Yes. They they were the moment of truth. They were you're the best around. And they were, and then they were the glory of love and all that stuff. And then fucking, you see, I, I was going to say you could tell at the third movie they were running out of ideas because they used the fucking Little River Band. At the end. Little River Band. Little they didn't quite well. They didn't quite know how to market the third movie. I guess it's about an old man who thinks he's a young man. But Johnny even name checks Chicago. He's like, Chicago's awesome, man. You know? Oh God. Peter Cetera, and I'm like, yeah, you listen to you listen to Metallica, but you also appreciate Peter Cetera. Okay, good for you, Johnny. Hey, I'm and then they play "You're the Inspiration." They play "You're the Inspiration," which is like the second most overplayed fucking Chicago song. Yeah. Ever. <laughs> my favorite. I'm, I just want to. I just want to put this out there because I've mentioned it in my reviews. Uh, I mentioned it in my Karate Kid Part Two review because I was talking about "Glory of Love" completely destroyed the world in 1986. Yes, it did. <laughs> my favorite. One of my favorite music videos of all time. Probably the greatest music video of all time, barring Thriller, mm -hmm. is Stay the Night by Chicago. Because it is an absolutely insane video. You have to watch this immediately if you have never seen it. It's, 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 it's almost like a parody of an action movie. Peter Cetera is making out with this chick in a gas station. He runs, he's like pumping gas for her, and he makes out with her. He tries to grab her boob. She beats the shit out of him, throws him to the ground, gets into the car. He gets on the hood of the car, and he's, he's singing, Stay the night. And it's all this, it's all these incredible, elaborate stunts. She goes up this ramp. She goes through a billboard that's advertising Chicago, the band. And the band is playing the song with Satara in a, a pickup truck that's going along with this entire action sequence. It's this incredibly elaborate video. It is like, seriously. I'm definitely going to check that out now. <laughs> it is seriously one of the greatest music videos ever. This is why they made videos back then. They sold these songs on the basis of all this amazing camera work that they did. All right, I am definitely checking. I that showed out. it. I showed it. My wife can't stand Chicago, and I showed this video to her, and she said that was the coolest thing I've ever seen. See, I'm um, not even. I'm not even a big Chicago fan, so I can semi sympathize with your wife. Like my mom loves Chicago, but I was never. I, you that know, big Chicago into didn't start out like that. They started out as oh, a yeah, jazz they, band. Yeah, they were a jazz fusion. It was like nine or ten. They were jazz guys. fusion. Yeah. They did this song. I forget. They were called Chicago Trans yeah, Authority. Yeah, CTA then they Chicago Trans Authority, which they quickly changed to Chicago. Come the next album, like the big songs, you know, Saturday in the Park. I. Do you, Saturday do you, do you, in the Park. Does anybody <laughs> really know what time it is? Twenty five or sixty four. You know, those are the songs yeah. I remember. You know, but I don't go back to them like that. Saturday. In the park, <laughs> think it was the Fourth of July, and that was that was, and then they turned into this power ballad and uh, band in the '80s, and that's what really we remember them for is all those songs. Oh well, yeah, <laughs> I mean, but then look at a lot of '70s artists. I mean, okay, better not different sound, but same comparison. Look at Heart. I mean, Heart was Heart just, started out. Yeah, they were like a they were kind of like a hard rock. They guitar were just driven a regular band. hard rock guitar driven band. I mean, f okay, you know what? Uh, what about me, Jefferson me, Starship? I Jefferson. I was just fucking gonna say that. I was like gonna say, "Fuck Heart." Let's talk about first Jefferson they started. Airplane. They were Jefferson Airplane, then they became Starship, and they were they were like, "Oh, well, that, you know, that was the one biggest pill one. makes you larger." That was and then the big then it became, "We built this city." Yeah. Eh, eh, we built this at corporate rock yeah. and all that stuff. Every band had their corporate rock phase. You know, Bon Jovi, Poison, Kiss, Kiss. Van Halen. Uh, right now, right now is a fucking Pepsi commercial. That's what you think about when you think about being, being right now. Just, uh, yeah, it was like the mid eighties was that corporate rock. Thing. Yeah. Lot, not the music, right? Yeah. Everyone did that corporate rock shit back in the day, but. Oh, I wanted to point out also that most of the original music that was made for the Karate Kid movies was all throwaways from Rocky movies. Yep. Glory of Love was supposed to have been a ballad for Rocky four, but there was really no way to kind of connect it, you know? Well, there was a lot, yeah, all, like, Moment of Truth from Survivor was supposed to be used in a Rocky movie. It was, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was used. Moment in... of Truth. Instead, they got Carrie Underwood singing it, which is a little weird. That, that, you see, that's, which, that's where, <laughs> I'm sorry, dude, that's where season four jumped the fucking shark, man. That's what, where season four Carrie jumped Underwood? the goddamn shark. 